to go therefore and make disciples of all nations, to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then really how we make disciples is to teach them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And so making disciples is really teaching us how to observe the commands that Christ gave his first disciples. Again, I've been a Christian for a little bit over 35 years. I've been in the Marine Corps for 25 years. And the commands of Christ really is, is foundational on what it is to be a disciple, what it is to be a follower of Christ. And so Jesus said, if you love me, and I'm sure we do love the Lord, all of us love the Lord. He says, well, then the way that we demonstrate that is we obey him. And so it's really hard to obey Christ's commands if we really don't understand what they mean. Most of the commands of the 49 commands, we'll see that we, sometimes we know a little bit about them. Sometimes we know things we thought we knew we were wrong, and sometimes we, don't, we were completely wrong. We didn't understand them at all. But our intent really on Wednesday nights is to really uh, to see Jesus for who he is and what he wants us to do and how we obey him, because that's really how we demonstrate our love for him is to obey him. And to, our command tonight is going to be deny yourself. The corresponding character quality of deny yourself is determination. Now, all the character qualities of Christ, as you can see on the right-hand side, these character qualities are really qualities that we cannot instill in ourselves. Matter of fact, in Hebrews 1.3, it says that Jesus is the express image of God. And that word image in the Greek means is the word character, which is the word character. So Jesus is actually the exact character of God. And so when we read about Jesus and we uh, read the Gospels about Jesus and everything we see about Jesus in his life, he walked, we're, we're literally seeing God. We're seeing the character of God, who God is. And that's pretty amazing to do that. And so each of these character qualities come as a result of obeying these commands. Again, we can't instill these qualities in us. And so if we learn what the uh, command to repent is, which we'll learn a little bit again tonight, then as we repent, or be repenting, as Jesus would say, then we, all, then we learn what humility is. And now, interesting, there's several verses in the Bible where the Lord says that he displays his handiwork through the stars and the sky and the sun and the moon and just all the vastness that's out there in our galaxies. It's kind of like his handiwork. But also in, in, in his creation, in, his, in the animals that he created, you may not know, but he also displays his character. The character of God can be seen in his different animals. Now, these character qualities for us, we have to learn these character qualities. We have to obey Christ's commands, and that's how these character qualities are in our lives. But we'll see in nature God instills some of these character qualities. And as an example for us, if, if we look at them, I don't always get a chance. Each of these commands has a corresponding character quality. I don't always get a chance to go over them, but tonight I'm going to take the time to go over yet another character quality of Christ that's displayed in nature, and I'm going to do that tonight through the Wolverine. One of the definitions of determination is rejecting any distraction which could hinder the completion of a task. And so I'm going to show you how that takes place in the Wolverine. Determination versus faint-heartedness, or determination versus lack of determination. And first of all, the habitat of the Wolverine is in the northern region, so we may not get a chance to actually see the Wolverine. The wolverine actually is the largest member of the weasel family, little weasel, and it has a little, uh, stands there at 35 pounds, the weasel. The color of the weasel, it has a, a glossy brown hair with uh, stripes of yellow along its side. That's how you can distinguish it is. Now the trappers and Indians of the day, and even people today, they have a, a respect for the wolverine. And the reason they have a respect for the wolverine is because this animal is not afraid of any opponent that's out there. It has no fear of any opponent, regardless of its size and of its strength. And actually, I took this picture from a video, which I will not show you, but actually this wolverine brought that deer down by itself, and as it was eating the deer, a bear came up to the wolverine to try to take, a 600-pound bear tried to take that carcass away from the wolverine, and I was pretty astonished when I saw the video. The wolverine actually killed the bear like 600 pound bear. And so it can kill a, a bear, it can kill mountain lions, it can kill moose, caribou, and it's, in its determination, in its persistence, it can do just about anything it sets its mind to do. And so as a result, bears and mountain lions and other predator animals, they literally back off when a wolverine is in the area. They will not challenge a wolverine. They have learned the hard way that you just don't mess around with a wolverine. 
But interesting, the, the wolverine actually has poor eyesight. It doesn't see very well. And so it has to rely on smell to find its food. It's also a very slow animal. It doesn't run very fast. And so what it will often do, it will use its ambush skills in order to find food. And so what it'll do, it'll climb up into a tree and as, or a small cliff, and as an animal would pass by, it would simply just jump on the back of the animal and then have it for lunch or dinner. Now, the wolverine eats just the whole animal. It's a different kind of an animal. Some animals will just eat organs or the flesh. The wolverine eats everything. It eats the head. It eats the feet. It eats everything, probably not the antlers, but it really devours this entire carcass. And sometimes when it gets a, a, a big animal, like a caribou or a large deer, it'll kind of break it in little pieces and it'll spread it throughout the forest. And what it'll do is it has this really nasty scent, worse than a skunk, that it sprays on top of these foods. So even the hungriest animals that are out there, they will not eat uh, pieces that the, that the wolverine has left. But it, also the wolverine can go for weeks and weeks without eating if it has to. The wolverine also has no problem in the snow or traveling in the snow or living in the snow. It doesn't hibernate at all. Matter of fact, one of the things about the wolverine that is interesting is that uh, its fur doesn't collect any type of frost or snow whatsoever. It doesn't stick to it. So you can see how the Eskimos, are, they like that to make coats, and inside of their coats, the frost or snow doesn't stick. And again, this is kind of a strange animal. It doesn't really, in snow, it doesn't run through snow, because in deep snow, it would be what we call pulse holing, as paws would go in up. It's, up to its uh, shoulders and it would, wouldn't be able to get around very quickly. But what the wolverine does is it literally hops and it hops on all four legs and then when it lands on its snow, it just lands on all four of its legs in a balanced way so that it doesn't actually sink into the snow. Now, the mama wolverines actually raise their little pups. Dad doesn't get involved in that process at all. Another kind of odd but interesting thing about the wolverine is that its cubs are the exact opposite color of the mom. So where the mom is dark, its cubs are light. And where the mom is light, the cubs are dark. So when you look at the mom and the cubs, they, they're actually exactly opposite of each other in color. Now these wolverines are also, they're very playful animals. And some of them have even learned to be friends with humans. As vicious as they can be, humans have bold enough to befriend some of these animals, as you can see here. And because of their unique sense of smell and their amazing capacity to dig, they've also been experimenting with wolverines to find humans that are caught in avalanches because they have a great sense of smell. They can find humans. Uh, I've seen some videos of them actually testing, finding uh, humans and digging them out very quickly. Now, legends have it, and there's a lot of legends about the wolverines. I guess there's an X-Man movie there about the wolverine, X, X-Man wolverine. But there's legends that say the wolverine will actually go and take food out of traps, any traps. And then it doesn't leave the trap there. It actually dismantles the trap and hides the trap. Again, that's maybe a legend, but uh, some people swear by it. But one thing you have to remember about the wolverine is that when it sets its mind on something, it's not a creature that you want to you mess around with. It's distinguished from all other animals because of its unique sense of determination. And so you're going to see in this command that we're going to look at tonight is that this type of determination that the wolverine has as a natural character quality is really the type of determination that we have to have in order to obey this command tonight, which is to deny yourself. And so the command that we're going to see tonight, that deny yourself, has some repeat information from repent and follow me. And as I was looking through this, I was thinking, well, I, I don't want to give you repeat information. That, that would be, could be boring at some points. But then I, as I started reading that Jesus repeated this, some of this information over and over and over again to his first disciples. And so since he did it, immediately I said, well, then we're going to do it too. Because if it's good for Jesus, it's good for me. Now, this command really is another invitation. Jesus gave many inv invitations. Matter of fact, Jesus came to seek and save that was lost. And so in the commands that we went through so far, repent, follow me, be reconciled, be perfect, seek God's kingdom, choose the narrow way, take my yoke, these are all commands that are really invitations to, again, invitation not as a suggestion of what we should do. When Jesus came into the world, he didn't suggest what we should do as his creation. He demanded, he commanded that these are the things that we need to do to inherit eternal life. And so Jesus came to seek and save the lost, and when he found the lost, 
he gave him what we call the gospel message, the good news message. And Jesus repeated this message that we're going to see tonight over and over again because it really is the heart of the gospel message. And in other words, if you want to go to heaven, this is how you get to heaven. And so because this command is very difficult to obey, we'll see that few people in the world will actually obey this command. And so although there will be some repeat information, I'm really going to focus on what it means to deny yourself, especially when we get to the application of this command. So before we get into God's word, let's pray. Lord, we just thank you so much that you've given us your word, that we don't live in a dark ages, we don't live in a time where we don't hear from you, we don't know anything about you, Lord. We live in a time where we have your complete Bible, we have manuscripts, Lord, and we can study, we have all kinds of tools to study, all kinds of ways to understand what, what you were telling us. And so, Lord, I pray tonight that each one of us that by your spirit you would teach us what it means to deny ourselves. Lord, you would challenge us and you would let us know where we're at with this. And Lord, once we understand this command, Lord, I pray that you would give us the determination, like the wolverine, to obey this command relentlessly. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so our command tonight comes from Luke 9.23, which is outside of Matthew. We've been looking mostly in Matthew, but this is Luke 9.23. And it starts at 9.23 and it says this, and he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. And what good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet lose or forfeit his very soul? And if anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory, and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. And that's where our context comes from. So in our interpretation, the first thing that Jesus said, he said to them all, and when he said to that all, that means to all people of all times, to you and I. And again, this is not a suggestion. Jesus' commands, they're really our demands. They're the requirements. They're the laws. If you want to live in heaven, which is God's home, then these are what you must do. You must obey his rules. You must obey Jesus' commands. And it's only natural if, if I go to your home or if you go to my home, you have your own rules and regulations for me entering to your home. And it's the same with Jesus. He has his home, which we call heaven. And these are his rules. These are his regulations. This is how you get there. And so we know that Jesus is the son of God. And another way of saying that, he's the only begotten son of God, which really means that he's God in the flesh. And so this command is coming from the one really who decides your and my eternity. And so in Philippians 2, 9, 11, it says this. It says, therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor, and he's given him a name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so in this command, we're really going to see what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? What does that mean? To be a disciple of Jesus, to come after him, to be a Christian, to be saved, or to get in heaven, what does that mean? And so this is how he starts. He says, if anyone would come after me, he must first deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, again, this command is repeated in all four of the Gospels. And I imagine that Jesus repeated this numerous times. It wasn't even recorded anywhere because this really is the heart of the Gospel message. This is how a person gets saved from hell. This is how we as disciples are supposed to live. In the command, follow me, we saw that there was a three-part test in that command, our second command that we had. And in the three-part test, Jesus basically laid out, there was large crowds, it says in Luke 14, 25, large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned around and he said to them. So you could picture that there's large crowds following Jesus, mostly because of the miracles that he did and the food that he did, that he gave them. And Jesus basically turned around and he gave them a three-part test. He says, if you pass this test, you will be with me in heaven. But if you don't pass this test, then you will not be with me in heaven. Don't be deceived. I am Jesus. I'm the creator of heaven and earth, and these are my requirements. And so these are the tests that he gave them. He said, if anyone comes after me and he does not hate his father and his mother, his wife and his children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciples. So that term, hate your own life, is given in this command, and it's the same thing that we see tonight. Deny yourself really means to hate yourself. It's the same thing. They're synonymous. 
in the second part of that test because it says end. It's not or, it's end. He says, end, if anyone does not carry his cross and then also follow me, then he simply cannot be my disciple. And so we're not going to go through this at detail, but I encourage you, if you, ha if you were not here for that command, the second command, follow me, that you go to the Internet and you pull that off and you read through those three tests in detail and see if you pass those tests, because if you do pass the test, Jesus says that you are his disciple. You have a place in his home. But if you don't pass those tests, again, we're not getting into how complete understanding of that, but as you read that, if you don't pass the test, it doesn't matter what you think or what you've been told. Jesus is telling us that you will not be in heaven. So I encourage you to go back and take that test if you haven't already. In test one, it was talking about denying yourself. And so this uh, is talking about hating yourself. And this command tonight, deny yourself, really explains how we do that. It explains how we deny ourselves. It really shows us what it means to hate yourself, what it means to de deny yourselves. Now we know in the Bible there's... Uh, uh, commands and instructions like wives submit to your husbands. And when we see the word submit, when women see the word submit, oftentimes it seems like a negative thing. People turn away from that instantly. But once you really understand what that means, it's not negative anymore. The same thing with deny yourself, hate yourself. The words themselves to deny yourself, to hate yourself, initially they sound uh, negative. But once you really understand what, what they mean, they're not negative at, at all. Matter of fact, Jesus often spoke in parables because if you really want to understand a power, parable, you have to really take the time to see and think through what the parable is talking about. And those that really hear parables at the surface level will just quickly turn away and just disregard what Jesus is saying. Things like, eat my body. It's like, no way, that's, that's, that's cannibalism. Drink my blood. No, I'm not going to do that either. Hate your mother and father. That sounds ridiculous. Hate your own children. That's crazy too. Hate yourself. So again, Jesus would often talk in parables because people didn't even give Jesus the time of day. They would simply walk away instead of trying to understand what he said. But those who take the time to understand what Jesus is saying really start to understand how awesome God really is. They, we start to understand how his words are really words of wisdoms. And once we do obey these commands of Christ, it really brings joy into our life. It brings freedom into our life. And it really gives us a glimpse of what eternal life will be, what it will be like when we live with Christ. And it only comes to those who believe. And the word really believe is synonymous with you act on Christ's commands. When you know what Christ's commands are, you simply act on what those commands are. And so Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. And so in our society today, to deny ourselves is really almost completely opposite of the way people live in our nature and in our culture. Our culture is consumed with self-love, ego building, self-esteem, feeling good about yourself, thinking you're important, thinking you're valuable, thinking that you're a hero, you're a star, you're American idol, thinking that you achieve great things and that you're worthy of some type of honor. That's how our society lives. Matter of fact, parents are encouraged to uh, increase their children's self-ego, their self-image, and even allow their children to explore their own individuality in this world that we live in, that if it feels good, if it, do it. And this, this young man's t-shirt says, nothing is wrong if it feels good. And so really our whole society is built around eat, drink, and be merry for today we live and tomorrow we die. That's the heart of our culture that we live in today. Paul would tell Timothy this. He said, Timothy, you should know this that in the last days there will be difficult times, for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud. They will be scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving, and they will slander others, and they will have no self-control. They will be cruel, and they will hate what is good. They will betray their friends. They'll be reckless. They'll be puffed up with pride. They'll love pleasures rather than God, and they will act religious, but they will reject the power that can make them godly. Stay away from people like that, Paul would tell Timothy. So here's the challenge that we have. When Jesus gives us this deny yourself gospel message, if you would ask people, do you believe in God? Most people would probably say yes. Do you want your sins forgiven? Of course, we would want our sins forgiven. Do you want to go to heaven? Yes, I would like to go to heaven. Well, then deny yourself take up your cross, and follow Jesus. 
And when people hear that, it's like, wait a minute, deny myself? I just want the free gift. I don't want to have to do anything. And so Martin Luther, as you may know, he was a Catholic priest. And at the time, people were not allowed to read the Bible because they were told that they couldn't comprehend what the Bible said. So the Bible was really interpreted to them. And so what Martin Luther did, he got a hold of the Bible and he read it himself. And once he read the Bible himself, he found many things, but he actually posted 95 different protests of what the Catholic Church was telling him, according, differently what the Bible was telling him. And he nailed it really on their main church, which was in Witten, Wittenberg, Germany. The fourth protest that he has on the list says this. He said, so repentance remains why self-hate remains. And so what Luther was saying is the concept of Jesus' command tonight to self-hate yourself, to deny yourself, that will keep a person being repentant. But if you don't have self-hate, if you don't understand what that means, then you will not be a repentant type person. And so here's the problem. Jeremiah would tell us, 17.9, that the human heart, your heart and mine, is the most deceitful of, of all things. It is desperately wicked, and who really knows how bad it is? I like what Pastor Chuck used to say. He would say, you don't have to deep dig in my heart to find dirt. It's right there below the surface. And so Paul actually compares his life in Philippians 3.8. He says his life is like garbage. It's actually like dung compared to the new life that he has in Christ. And see, our culture today of self-love, they certainly do not view their lives as garbage, as rubbish, as dung. Job says in Job 42.5, he says, Now my eyes, have, I have seen you, Lord, and because I've seen you, I detest myself. I despise myself. I hate myself. I reject myself, and I, and I will repent in dust and ashes. And in the Hebrew language, what Job was saying there when he detests his life, he was saying, Everything that I am, apart from God. Everything that I am as a result of this sinful nature that I have is corrupt and evil, and I hate that part of who I am. Paul would say in Romans 7:18, he goes, for I know that there's nothing good that lives in me, that is in my sinful nature. And, but today people brag of themselves, how good they are, how many things they have accomplished, how desirable they are, and the list just goes on and on of how much people love themselves today. Isaiah would say this in Isaiah 6, 5. When Isaiah saw a vision of the Lord, this is what he said. He said, it, it's all over. He goes, I'm doomed now. I'm a sinful man. I have filthy lips, and I live amongst people with filthy lips, yet I have seen the Lord. I have seen the God of heaven's armies. And all people in the Bible that understand that in comparison to God's holiness, to his righteousness, to his goodness, that our sinful natures we do not merit any type of recognition. And see, this is the problem. We see that white sheep against the green background, they look fairly white. However, the same white sheep against a snow white background, they don't look white at all. And see, what happens in our eyes, we appear that we're pretty good. But see, God sees differently than what we see, and we need to see ourselves as God sees ourselves. And so this is why the Lord would tell us in Isaiah 1.18. I love it when he says this. He says, come now, let's settle this. And if you read the whole chapter of 1, what he's talking about to you and I, it's like, you know that you're wicked. I know that you're wicked. You know that you're sinful. So let's, just, let's settle this. Let's just get this over with once and for all, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. And that's awesome that God would do that for us. When Simon Peter realized who Jesus was when he was in the boat. Jesus told him to throw the net out to the right side, and they got so much fish, and at that time it started to, the lights came on in Peter's mind, and he realized who Jesus was. This is what he said. In Luke 5, 8, he said he fell to his knees before Jesus, and he said, Oh, Lord, please leave me alone, because I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. Even the tax collector in Luke 18, 13 he stood at a distance, it says, and he dared not lift his eyes to heaven, and he prayed. He said he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, O oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. And see, when we really understand who we are in God's eyes, it will cause us to repent, and we'll get into what repent means in a second. Luke 
Luke 5, 3, the Lord says, I didn't call those people in the world that think they're righteous, but I call those people who know that they are sinners and that they need to repent. And see, what happens is pride causes people to be blind. People love themselves. They're impressed with their own lives. They're impressed with their own money, their success, their religion, and most people already think that they're righteous in God's eyes. Some even think that they're God's gift to this world and that they should be honored for being that gift. I've even heard people say that they're God's gift to this world. And so prideful people do not repent. Prideful people, uh, they even turn away and, and they think it's foolish that they should repent or even hate themselves. So again, in this command, Jesus will show us what it means to be a follower, what it means to be a disciple, what it means to come after him, what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be saved, and what it means to get to heaven. So he says, deny yourself. And what he's saying is deny anything that you have within you that think you're worthy, that you can offer what you have to God in exchange for eternal life. We have nothing worthy. We have nothing to exchange for eternal life. In Luke 13, 3 and 5, Jesus repeats it twice. He says, I tell you, unless you repent, you too will all perish. Luke 24, 47, it says, For it was also written that this message of repentance would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem, that there is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. And so there's actually three Greek words that mean repent, and this is in your outline if you have your outline. The first word for repent, and I'm not going to try to pronounce these Greek words because I know I get them wrong, so I put them in your outline. The first word for repent is to change your mind. To change your mind how you view about yourself. That you are really not God's gift to this world. You understand that your heart is desperately wicked. And if you're honest with yourself, we know that. The lust of the eyes, we have it. The lust of the flesh, we have it. The pride of life, we have it. We need to admit to God that we are corrupt, that we are a sinner. We need to change our minds. God is right and what he says, and we are wrong. The second part of repent means that you need to change your heart. Change your heart about how you feel about sin. Some people don't care about sin. They sin. They have fun. And sin can be fun, but once you understand what sin is, it will bring a regret into your life. It will bring some type of remorse. It will bring a sorrow. It really should bring a shame over sin. As we know more about sin and what it does, it really should sicken us and what it does to God, it separates him from creation. It separates us from seeing God and touching God and hearing God personally. What it does to you in your life, the diseases and the sins and the death that it brings, and how it affects everyone, sin destroys everyone. And so we need to change our heart and feel remorse and be sickened by sin. And then we need to change our direction. We need to stop living for ourselves. We need to stop living for just our will, my will be done. We need to stop trusting in our own merit that somehow we're going to be good enough to earn heaven. We need to turn from ourselves and turn to the Lord for complete forgiveness and for a new life. See, repentance starts in your mind. It moves to your emotions, and then it is activated in your actions. And this is the actions that Paul would tell us that we need to do. In Romans 10, he says this, that if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And then he explains it. He says, for it's with your heart that you believe, and you're justified, which means you know what the truth is, but it doesn't stop there. It needs to go into action. But it's with your mouth that you confess, and then you're saved. You literally have to confess your sins to the Lord. Repent, again, means to change the way that you view yourself. You feel remorse when you see how sinful you really are, and you turn away from yourself, and you turn to God. Now, this guy who has a very long name, David Martin Lloyd-Jones, he, ca he captured it like this. And I usually don't quote people, but I like the way that he, he captured this. This is what he says. Repentance means that you're, you realize that you are guilty. You're a vile sinner in the presence of God and that you deserve the wrath and punishment of God and that you are hell-bound. It means that you begin to realize that this thing called sin is in you and you long to get rid of it. And you turn your back on it in every shape and form. You renounce the world, whatever the cost is, the world and its mind and the outlook of the world and all its practices. You deny yourself, you take up your cross, and you go after Christ. You see, when we see that this thing called sin that he says is in us, 
we understand that this sin destroys us and it really separates us from God, we'll begin to want to get rid of this thing called sin in our life. But there's only one way to get rid of sin in your life, in my life, and that's to die. A dead person cannot sin. You stop sinning when you die. And so Jesus will tell you to take up your cross. And what this means is to be willing to die, to sin. And so here's an example of what that may mean. There was a plantation slave that he was always happy and he was singing. No matter what happened to him, his joy was always abounding. He was singing it. And one day his master, he asked him, he said, what have you got that make you so happy? And the slave replied, he goes, I love the Lord Jesus with all my heart. And he has forgiven me my sin and he has put a song in my heart. He goes, well, well, how do I get what you have, this master asked. He says, well, go now and put on your best Sunday vest and come down here and work with us in the mud. And then you can have it, came the reply. And he said, I would never do that, the owner responded resentfully, and he rode off on his horse. Well, some weeks later, the master asked the same question, and he was given the same answer. And then a few weeks later, he came a third time, and he said, now be straight with me. What do I have to do to get what you have? He said, just as I've told you all the other times, came the answer. So in desperation, the owner said, all right, I'll do it. And so then a slave responded, now you don't have to do it. You just had to be willing to do it. And so Jesus doesn't literally call us to die, but he calls us to be willing to die for ourselves. Jesus told the Pharisees the same thing. But their self-love and their self-righteous attitude was useless, he told them. But instead of listening to Jesus, they hated Jesus. And he says in Matthew 21, 31, he goes, I tell you the truth, corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you do. And then Jesus gives this, what's called a paradox. A paradox is a thought, contains two thoughts that seem like they contradict each other, but for some reason they're both true. An example is you tell somebody that your, your deep thoughts are shallow. Well, how can deep thoughts be shallow? And so what Jesus says here, this paradox he says, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. And whoever wants to lose his life will find it, will save it. And so the paradox is, do you want eternal life? Do you want to live? And if your answer is yes, he says, then you must die. That's the paradox. And so once again, Jesus only gives us two choices, like he always does. In this case, he choose life, live or die. We see it before that he gives us two gates, the narrow and the wide, two ways, to narrow and abroad, two destinations, heaven or the lake of fire, two groups, the few and the many, two kinds of trees, the good and the bad, two kinds of fruit, the good and the bad, two kinds of people, believers and non-believers, two kinds of builders, the wise and the foolish, two foundations, rock and the sand, two houses, the secure and the non-secure. And now he's telling us to give up our lives. And when we give up our lives, he says we'll be saved from eternal damnation and we'll have heaven. But if we hold on to our lives, we will lose our lives to an eternal damnation, which is hell. And so Jesus repeats this several, several times in the Gospels. For example, in Matthew 10, 39, he says this, If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give it up, your life for me, you will find it. And then in John 12, 25, he says, The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And then Jesus gives us this, exaggeration, this hyperbole. It says this, he goes, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very soul? And again, that's an exaggeration. See, many people think that they have a lot to give up if they come to Christ. They think that Jesus is asking too much of them. It's just too much to do what the Lord has asked. And so the, the Lord turns it around and he tells us like this. He says, okay, let's say that you literally owned the whole world. You were the richest man in the world. You were the smartest. You were the most powerful man. You had all the honor. You really had it all. You had everything that the world hopes to have. And so now that you have it all, what good is it if you die and you lose your soul in hell forever? Matthew would say it like this. He says, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? How much really is your soul worth? We know our physical bodies will die one day as a result of sin, but the Bible tells us everywhere that our souls will live forever somewhere. And so Jesus is saying this again, it's amazing. He says, recognize that there's no good in you. And so as a result, give me your life. 
At this time, I will pay the price. But for us today, he goes, I've paid the price for your sin. I will forgive you for all your sin. And I will give you eternal life if you give me your life. Or hold on to your life now. Reject me. And when you die, you will pay the penalty for your own sins in the lake of fire for eternity. And so if we had everything that this world had to offer, it's really nothing compared to eternal life and being with the Lord. And so that's really the message of the gospel itself. That's the good news that Christ gives us. We give him his life. We die to ourselves. He gives us eternal life. And that's the choice every person has to make. Everyone is going to see God one day. Either we're going to go see him as our Lord and our Savior, as our King, or we're going to see him as our judge. And Jesus says this, If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Now this is the first time in the New Testament where Jesus said that he's coming back. You see, the people of the time, the Pharisees, the disciples, they, they never understood the concept that Jesus was coming twice. They only thought he was coming once. And so when Jesus came, the Messiah came, they thought he was going to stay. They never thought he was ever going to leave. And so he says, when the Son of Man comes again in his glory. So he says, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words, this really means that if you reject Jesus, if you refuse to repent, then it's the same thing as being ashamed of Jesus. In Matthew 10, 32, he says this, Who, Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, then I will disown him before my Father who is in heaven. In John 5, 24, he says this, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God, who has sent me, has, have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death to life. And in John 5, 22, he says, A day of judgment is coming. The Father has given all judgment to the Son, and when the Son of Man comes, who is also the Son of God, when he comes in his glory, with his father, uh, the glory of his Father and with, of his angels, he will then repay every man according to his own deeds. And then in John 5, 28, he says this, He goes, Don't, don't be so surprised. Indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's Son, and they will rise again. And those who have done good will rise to experience eternal life, but those who have continued in evil will, will, will experience judgment. John says this in the last book of the Bible. He says, and I saw in John, 20, uh, sorry, Revelation 20:11. he says, and I saw a great white throne and one seating on it. In the earth and sky they fled away from his presence, but they found no place to hide. And I saw the dead, both small and great, standing before God's throne. And the books were open, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. And even the sea gave up its dead, and the dead and death and the grave gave up their dead. And all were judged according to their works. And then death and the grave, they were thrown into the lake of fire. This is, the lake of fire is the second death. You'll die once but then you'll die again in the lake of fire. And if anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So again, Jesus gives us two choices. Deny yourself now, and I'll write your name in my book of life. But don't deny yourself now. Then you can live however you want, do whatever you want, eat, drink, and be merry, enjoy your life, but your name will not be written in the book of life. But he says anyone whose name was not written in the book of life will be thrown in the lake of fire. And I thank God my name's written in the book of life. <laughs> what, what a deal. Give up my life, which is nothing compared to what God has for us, and gain eternal life. But interesting, most people will not do it. The Bible tells us many will refuse him. So the time we have remaining, I want to really look at what the application of this means to deny ourselves. And see, our sinful nature, you know and I know, it wants to do what it wants to do when it wants to do it. That's how we are. That's how we're wired. And really the thought of denying yourself will cause a war within yourself, a call war within your spirit and your soul and your body because your body just wants when it wants when it wants it. An analogy, when I was in the Marine Corps, when I would go home, sometimes I would be tired, but in the unit I was in, we did a lot of running. We, they just loved to run, so I needed to keep up on my running. So usually we'd get home, and if I hadn't ran at work, I'd run about five miles. 
And so one day I was out running down by the beach and I just decided to go about three miles this day, or, or th I think it was five miles because I don't think I've ever ran three miles uh, when I would do those runs. Cause so I was out there and about the two mile mark, my body started telling me that it was tired, that I needed to go home and just eat and I deserved to take a rest. And so I, I've always had this war in my mind and it's just show you how crazy Marines can be. But this is, when I thought about this command, this is something that I've intuitively understood even as a Marine on how you deny yourself. And so I pretty much told my body that it needs to stop whining or complaining or we're gonna go six miles. And so you might think I'm a little crazy because I literally would talk to myself like that. And so again, my body would start to whine, six miles, you're tired, you gotta make dinner, you know, you got a long night, you got a hard day. And I, I would tell it again, look, if you keep whining and complaining, we're going seven miles. And of course it would whine and complain. And then I would just say, that's it, we're going seven miles. And it just would not stop. And so I said, look, if you still keep complaining, because my mind controls my body, my body doesn't control my mind. We have a saying, the Marine Corps mind over matter. It, uh, you don't mind, but it doesn't matter anyway. And so <laughs> I would say, if you keep whining and complaining, not only we're gonna go seven miles, but when we go home, I'm not even gonna eat. I'll just miss the meal. And then after a period of time, my body would just stop whining and complaining. It would just do what I tell it to do. And that's how it should be in our life. Our body should do what our mind tells it to do, not the other way around. And so really we see what Jesus is telling us is that, that we conquer by death, not by life. In Matthew 8:31. It says, Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and then be rejected, that he would be killed, but three days later he would rise from the dead. And then he was talking about this openly with his disciples. Like in picture, it says, it says Peter took him aside. He said, Lord, come here. And Peter began to reprimand Jesus. And he said, you shouldn't be saying these things. And so Jesus turned around and he looked at him and all of his disciples, and then he reprimanded Peter. And he said, get away from me, Satan. And I imagine Peter was shocked, like, whoa. And he said, you are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's point of view. And see, what Peter saw, that Jesus' death was a defeat. But we know that it was through Jesus' death that we've gained eternal life. See, at the cross, Jesus took the legal documents from Satan. The legal document contains all the sins that you and I have committed. The legal document that we deserve to go to hell. The accusations and the crimes and the uh, laws that we broke and we deserve punishment for it. And through Jesus' blood, what he did is, is he actually blotted out that document. It says in Colossians 2.14, Paul would say it like this. He said, God wiped out the charges that were against us for bis disobeying the law of Moses. He took them away and he nailed them to the cross. And in this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and the authorities. He actually shamed them publicly by his victory over death on the cross. And so again, the paradox is this. If you want eternal life, you must die. You must deny yourself. And so what does it mean to deny yourself? First of all, first of all deny yourself or hate yourself does not in any way mean to harm yourself or to injure yourself, as some people may think. The Buddhists will sometimes set themselves on fire. I don't know if you've ever seen that. It's a pretty crazy thing. There's another religion that is just as crazy. People will blow themselves up in hopes of getting this really, is, uh, it shouldn't be funny, but it was funny to me, in hopes of getting 72 black-eyed virgins, 72 black-eyed virgins who are waiting for them on green pillows. That's what, the, that's what they're hoping for. Denying yourself also does not mean that you get rid of all your money, you get rid of all your possessions, you become homeless, and you stand on a street corner with some, some sign that says, I hate myself. That's not what it means, deny yourself. Deny yourself does also not mean that you stop showering or stop using deodorant and that kind of stuff. So I encourage you not to do that. So it literally doesn't mean that you hate yourself. That's not what it means. The word deny, the word deny, it means to completely disown. It means to utterly separate yourself from someone or something. And then the word yourself means to th refers to your sinful fallen nature. It refers to your, 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 your rebellious, stubborn self. It refers to your evil desires. 
that part of yourself. And Paul would say in Ephesians 4, 22, you need to throw off your old sinful nature in your former way of life because it's corrupted by lust and deception. And so if you put the two together, deny, completely disown, and yourself, your sinful fallen nature, this is what deny yourself means. It first means put no confidence whatsoever in yourself. Philippians 3.3 3 says it like this, that we need to rely on Christ Jesus and all that he, w- he has done. We put no confidence in human effort whatsoever. So that's the first way that we deny ourselves. We have no merit within ourselves, within our sinful nature. We have nothing to offer God in exchange for eternal life. The second way we deny ourselves is dis- to disown and really refuse to associate with yourself, with your sinful nature. Just refuse to associate it with it. In Ephesians 2, 3, it says this, but all of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. But our very natures, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else's. Another way of denying ourselves is we need to refuse to be driven and controlled by your sinful nature. Galatians 2.20 says, For my old self has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And so, as I live in this earthly body, by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Another way to deny yourself is to recognize and then deny your your evil desires. Romans 13.14 says it like this. It says, Instead, clothe yourselves in the presence of the Lord Christ. And don't let yourselves even think about ways to indulge in your evil desires. And see, this is something, at least my, I hear my wife say to my kids all the time. She says, don't even think about it. <laughs> my kids will come up and they'll have some idea that they want to do, and before they get a word out, she'll say, don't, don't even think about it. And see, that's what God is saying to us, in his, his essence, as our Father in Heaven, and we're His children, when it comes to sinful thoughts, when these things come into your mind, whatever it may be, He just says, this, don't even think about it. Don't even go there. And that's what Paul is telling us also. In Galatians 5.24 says, those who belong to Christ Jesus, we have nailed the passion and the sinful passions and desires of our sinful nature on the cross. We have crucified them there. In Romans 6, starting in verse 11, Paul says this, so you also should consider yourself dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Do not let sin control the way that you live. Do not give in to your sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourself completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have a new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right and for the glory of God. Paul would also tell us that denying yourself is a daily event. In 1 Corinthians 15, 31, he says, I die daily. And so when we fail, when we fall down, when we don't die daily today, then we just start again the next day. I think it's in Lamentations 3. It says his mercies are new every morning. Every morning we get a new start. What does it mean to take up our cross? Jesus says take up your cross. See, the cross really symbolizes many things, but three main things it symbolizes. It symbolizes, for one, it symbolizes death. In Romans 6.23, it says, For the wages of sin is death. The wages are what we get, what we earn, what we deserve for sin. In John 19.30, it says this, that Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. No one killed Jesus. Jesus gave up his own spirit. And so he said, It is finished. And what was finished was the penalty of sin. The wages of sin is death has been paid on the cross. Jesus paid it once and for all. And so the cross also symbolizes life. Jesus said in John 11:25, he said, I am the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then he said, do you believe this? And Jesus' resurrection from the dead really conquered death and gave us eternal life. The cross also symbolizes power. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are heading for destruction. But we who are being saved, we know that it is the very power of God. Also, although the cross is a symbol of power, the cross also gives us power. It gives us power to crucify the world around us. 
Paul says it in Galatians 6, 14. He says, And as for me, may I never boast about anything except for the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified, and the world's interest in me has also died. The, power, the cross also gives us the power for endurance. In Hebrews 12:1 it says this, Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. You and I have particular sins that seem to always trip us up. They seem to never go away. Paul's saying, just get rid of them. Finally, just get rid of them. Don't toy around with them. Don't play with them. Don't flirt with them. Just get rid of them. And now let's run with endurance the race that God has set before us. The cross also gives us the power to conquer the flesh. Paul says in Romans 7, 21, he says, I have discovered this principle in life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. Now, I love God's word with all my heart, but there's another power that lives within me that's at war with my mind. And this power wants to make me a slave to sin that is within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who's going to free me from this life that is dominated by the sinful nature and death? And then he says, thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's why two commands ago we saw Jesus said, take my yoke, follow him. Be yoked to Christ. Let him lead you around so that you don't lead yourself around. Also, the cross gives us the power over the fear of death. In Hebrews 2.14 it says, Because God's children are human beings, were made of flesh and blood, the Son of God also had to become flesh and blood. For only a human being could die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil, who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set us free, for all those people that live as slaves to the fear of dying. You and I should not have a fear of dying at all. For, for dying, as they say in the New Testament, that it really is simply like going to sleep for us. We have all go to sleep. You don't know where you're at when you're sleeping, but then you'll wake up in heaven. So death should have no fear in us. And so finally, what is your cross? We have to deny ourselves, pick up our cross, but what is your cross? Now, Jesus said didn't say take my, his cross. We can't take Jesus' cross. But he told us to take your cross. Your cross and my cross are different. Each one of our crosses are different in this world. And so I don't know what your cross is, and you don't know what my cross is. We could learn and know what they are. But these are just some example of crosses that some people bear. The first one is accepting a task that's more than you can accomplish, that's greater than you can accomplish within your own strength. And see, if we pick up a cross that we can do in our own strength, if we pick up a task that we can do within our own human nature, then we simply got the wrong cross. Because even the cross that Jesus picked up, he could not carry himself. He needed someone to help him. And 2 Corinthians 12, 9, it says this. Timothy told Paul that the task that he gave Timothy was too heavy. And Paul told him, he said, the Lord told him through Paul, he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Another cross that some people bear is they experience pain and they experience hardship in life. They experience some type of sickness, terminal disease, death of a loved one, and there's goes on and on and on the hardship that people experience. And so in 2 Corinthians 1, 4, we get a little bit of an answer on why. The Lord said he comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort others when they are troubles, so that we will be able to give other people the same comfort that God has given us. I talked to many people that have lost their husbands in the war, and they don't understand why, and I don't understand why either, but I, I can tell them that the Lord will comfort them. There's a phases that they're going to have to go through, but once they go through those phases and the Lord comforts them in that, they're going to inevitably meet somebody else that's going through the same thing. And some women may even want to commit suicide because they can't handle it. And then this Christian woman comes along and, and they simply say, you, you can't understand what I'm going through. And the woman can say, I, I do understand. My husband also died. And they don't understand how they got through it. And so the person can share with that person how the Lord comforted them. And so oftentimes the Lord allows us to experience pain and hardship in our life because the world experiences pain and hardship. It rains on the just and the unjust. 
And if we were immune from all these things, we would never have compassion. We would never have empathy for other people. So the Lord allows us to go through these things so that we can comfort others with the comfort that the Lord gives us. Another cross that you may pick up is the cross of ministry. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 15, he goes, I will gladly devote myself and all that I have to you. And another cross may be simply being rejected by your family and by your friends because you're a Christian. David experienced it in Psalms 41, 9. He says, even my best friend, the one I've trusted completely, the one I even shared my food with, he has turned against me. There's a song you may have heard that originated in India. It's called, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. And a writer of that song, actually in India, when you decide to follow Jesus, you are excommunicated from your family. You don't get to live with your wife anymore. You lose your wife. You lose your children. You lose your money. You lose your job. You lose your citizenship. You lose everything. And so he wrote this song, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. He was rejected by his family and friends. And that was a cross he had to bear. And so what Jesus is saying in this command, he goes, do you want Jesus? Do you want eternal life? And so Jesus commands us. It's not a suggestion. And it's to all of us, to all people of all times. He says in Luke 9, 23, he says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. For what good is it if a man would gain the whole world, yet lose or forfeit his own soul? And if anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. And so let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you have took our sins on the cross. You have died in our place. And Lord, you simply tell us that we should die to our sinful nature. All that is wicked, all that is corrupt, all that has been stained and tainted from the time of the garden that we should give up, forsake all that, and then pick up the cross that you've given us and simply to follow you, to repent, to change our minds that you are right and we are wrong, to change our hearts to feel remorse and sorrow and regret for all that sin does, and then to turn to you and confess you as our Lord and Savior. And so, Lord, I thank you again for this command, and I just pray that as we go through this week, Lord, and you test us, you test us the lust of our eyes, the lust of our flesh, our pride of life, Lord, I pray by your spirit that you will bring these things to our remembrance. And Lord, more importantly, that you will give us your strength, that we will be yoked to you. We will beware of the leaven. And Lord, now we will deny ourselves. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.